Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I think we ought to get started. Uh, my name is Jeff DeBelco. I have the good fortune of directing our Environmental Change and Security Program. And on behalf of my colleague, Bob Hathaway, of our Asia Program, and Michael Kugelman, who I think is, uh, will be joining us shortly, uh, also with the Asia Program, it gives us a tremendous pleasure to welcome you uh, this morning for a session that's been entitled The Future of South Asian Security, Prospects for a Non-Traditional Regional Architecture. Uh, what we will have the benefit of hearing from with this distinguished panel is really uh, the product of multiple years of work of the National Bureau of Asian Research, who's brought together this diverse group of um, scholars and practitioners to really try to tackle what the the, well, the, really the range of, uh, we call them non-traditional, and they're diverse, and in part it's to talk about things in a, more, in a broader conversation than our traditional security frame, but at the same time connect it to those issues of high politics. And so it's um, terrific that Mahin Karim and her colleagues here have uh, given us this opportunity to hear about the product of work that I think the panelists will agree has um, challenged them and given them opportunity to think in ways that uh, we don't always have the luxury of doing within our silos, within our bureaucracies, within our disciplines. And so we very much look forward to, to hearing uh, uh, about the insights that they've generated in this challenging issues and challenging region. Uh, just a word about the Wilson Center, uh, where, where, where we're sitting. Uh, we're the formal memorial to Wilson. Wilson was our only president to have a PhD, so Congress in 1968 uh, saw it as appropriate to set up a living memorial where the worlds of scholarship and the worlds of policy could come together and learn from one another uh, and try to improve both uh, endeavors. Um, our environmental change and security program tries to look at some of these issues of environment, development, health, population, food security, many of the issues we'll, we'll hear about today and understand how they do or don't fit into a foreign policy and security policy uh, context. The Asia program it's a very active program, uh, an older program, one of, the, one of the early programs here at the Wilson Center that has been very active in, in looking at a range of issues in, in South Asia, uh, Pakistan in particular, uh, with a special focus and series there. Um, and so it's, um, it's quite regular that we have the opportunity to collaborate with, with our Asia program colleagues. We hope you will uh, uh, avail yourself of the various um, uh, write-ups and resources on on these issues in this in this region that we have at the center, but I'm going to turn the floor over now to to Mahin Karim, who really is the one who is the <coughs> energy about getting us, the person responsible for getting us here to get, uh, to, uh, together today, uh, and tell you a little bit about this effort, and then uh, turn it over to our to our experts to begin the session. So, Mahin, please. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm um, Mahin Karim. I'm a senior associate at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, and it's our, our pleasure indeed to be here today and partner uh, with the Woodrow Wilson Center for this, um, uh, what will hopefully be an interesting uh, discussion this morning. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Jeff and his colleagues here at the center for, for um, making it happen. Um, our event today, as, as Jeff mentioned, is part of a, a three-year project sponsored by the uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation's um, Asia Security Initiative. Um, the goal of the project was to explore opportunities in the near term for regional cooperation on non-traditional security challenges in South Asia, with the hope that these might then yield dividends um, in the long term toward resolving some of the region's long-standing traditional security problems. Um, applying NBR's unique sort of alternative futures model of scenario analysis, uh, the project invited uh, participation from a diverse group of regional experts, um, including representatives from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, the Maldives, um, China, and of course the United States. And we partnered with uh, regional institutions uh, for a series of, of workshops over the past three years. Uh, we launched the project with a first phase workshop um, exploring non-traditional security challenges in South Asia 2025 in November 2009 um, in Dhaka, Bangladesh with the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute. Um, and this first phase of the project focused on identifying and discussing key trends and challenges that South Asia is likely to face in the sort of a 10 to 15 year timeline um, in the non-traditional areas of food and water security, environmental security and disaster management, 
and health and human security. Um, a number of, of NBR projects over the past few years have successfully applied innovative alternative futures models of, of scenario an analysis to inform policy debate. Um, and a key component of that first workshop uh, was a dedicated full-day scenario um, exercise to examine and, and tease out the implications um, of three potential um, future scenarios uh, for South Asia's non-traditional security environment um, in 2025. Um, building on those findings from the first phase initiative, in December 2010, uh, we then partnered with the Regional Centre for Strategic Studies in Colombo, Sri Lanka, for the project's second phase workshop, um, looking at non-traditional security challenges and opportunities for cooperation, um, South Asia 2025. And this phase of the project um, basically expanded the discussion from assessing the NTS challenges um, South Asia faces in the future um, to exploring potential um, hypothetical future frameworks of, of regional cooperation um, to address those challenges. Um, then for the final uh, third regional workshop in Delhi, we partnered with the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies um, and last November. And here again, we built on the phase two workshop, which looked at you know, potential future cooperation frameworks for South Asia um, and expanded the discussion further to address feasibility or, or pathways to taking that framework from concept to implementation. Um, again, as a means to tease out among participants the broader implications of regional um, NTS challenges um, uh, for South Asia's future uh, traditional security environment. In our conception of the project um, and our decision to apply a futures methodology to how we approached um, the workshop discussion, our goal was to create and encourage a space for workshop participants to engage in a thinking exercise. We wanted to try and break away from the silos of thinking that um, um, we, in not just in South Asia, but, but also in the US, I think, find us, often find ourselves stuck in, um, and to see if by deconstructing some of the assumptions and preconceptions um, that inform those silos, we might arrive at alternative, outside-the-box ways of looking at these critical issues. Um, that might then hopefully effectively feed back into the policy process to address some of these challenges confronting um, South Asian policy corridors today and, and into the future. Um, so in the course of the three regional workshops, um, a key point that we reinforced to all participants was that the type of exercise and scenario analysis um, that we were engaging in was not an attempt to predict or forecast the future. Rather, the goal was to facilitate an analytical process of thinking through, finding solutions to, and assessing the implications of the policy challenges that we face um, by providing a space for participants to rethink, reinvent, and, and broaden the scope of possibilities for addressing such challenges um, beyond the traditional silos or, or comfort zones of how they, how they um, normally um, are prone to think about these issues. Um, so effectively, what we've been experimenting with these um, uh, with these past three years is, is a thought exercise, and we're privileged to have a few of the um, the guinea pigs of that exercise uh, with us today to share insights um, from the project. Um, before I hand it um, over to Roy to introduce our speakers and, and um, uh, moderate the presentations and discussion to follow, I wanted to draw attention to some of the big picture themes um, that seem to emerge from our three uh, workshop exercises. Um, first, the impact of non-traditional security challenges on, on the security paradigm. Um, the nature of NTS challenges faced by South Asia um, may offer up opportunities to change the security agenda, perhaps even subsuming traditional security concerns in the region. Um, in fact, as a number of our, of our participants over the three years articulated, the non-traditional security threats of tomorrow um, could themselves become sources of future uh, traditional conflict if they're not effectively addressed today. And there's an urgency in bringing that aspect to the forefront that I think is, is, doesn't necessarily currently exist in, in, in policy um, corridors. Um, 
And this kind of potential paradigm shift from traditional to non-traditional security may then also redefine other notions of security. Um, for, in, for instance, a shift from um, national security to human security priorities, um, or from uh, state-centric to people-centric approaches to security solutions, and perhaps transitioning from track one and track two to a more track three citizen diplomacy that mobilizes political will um, both within and across um, state boundaries. Um, second, looking at opportunities and challenges offered by South Asia's um, demographic dividend. Um, the region's youth bulge, uh, particularly in the context of an emerging or next generation of policymakers, offers opportunities for new thinking on traditional security issues that are unhampered by the baggage of history. And um, as, as those of us in South Asia know, there's a lot of baggage that we carry. Um, perhaps you know, we might have a generation that's more willing to engage multilaterally than previous or, or current uh, generations have demonstrated um, to have been. Likewise, a tech-savvy, globalized emerging generation also offers opportunities for new thinking on solutions to, to NTS challenges. Um, on the flip side, um, a youth bulge in that region with inadequate educational resources or employment opportunities um, also potentials, uh, uh, poses potential challenges to uh, the region's um, stability. Um, third, implications of, of a technological revolution and, and the role of the media. Um, increasing rates of, of connectivity in this region offer unprecedented opportunities for collaboration um, in terms of bridging the knowledge divide, mobilizing people across borders and regions, um, and perhaps even contributing to ground up track three pressures on, on top down track one and track two um, uh, to institute political or geopolitical change. And we're already seeing signs of this, the recent um, Anna Hazarika movement in, in India, I think, being a, a, an interesting example of that. Um, the Delhi workshop, in particular, raised the intriguing possibility of more deliberately and effectively um, leveraging the region's media infrastructure, which um, may already be more connected at a trans-regional level than, than some other sectors of South Asian society, to raise public awareness on precisely the kinds of issues that South Asian gov governments could and, and should be looking at um, and working together on, um, and, and to thereby instigate the kind of, uh, of, of grander pressures uh, required to motivate political leadership and political will um, in those directions. Um, on a related note, a, a technology leap also offers opportunities for new ways of thinking uh, um, on solutions to South Asia's um, stress, uh, stresses. And one idea proposed was why not get the research communities um, um, essentially the brain trusts in, in, in these countries to collaborate more effectively on, on such, um, such issues. Um, at the same time, of course, and, and um, uh, this is something that Richard had, had mentioned and, and, and brought up as well as others in the workshops, um, technologies um, are also not without risks um, and as they do have the potential to further divide and, and fragment societies. Um, and uh, the mobilizing capacity of technology across transnational boundaries and communities can be used for negative purposes just as much as they can be leveraged for positive um, um, uses. Um, fourth, of course, implications of the rise of, of India, and, and not surprisingly, um, the, you know, India's rise in the global arena and its role in South Asia uh, featured quite prominently in, in all three of the workshop discussions. Um, again, perhaps not surprisingly, the strongest objections to the sort of supernatural nature of, of uh, the hypothetical future co cooperative framework that was proposed by Ambassador Karim came from the audience at our Delhi workshop, um, where a number of the Indian policy folks in the room expressed um, discomfort with the notion of juxt juxtaposing national sovereignty against a supranational body whose authority would and, and jurisdiction could potentially supersede um, national interests. Um, what was interesting is that the representatives of the smaller countries um, in the region, um, and this came up in both the Dhaka and the Colombo workshops, seemed um, much less concerned with such issues. In fact, and significantly, they seemed to view India's rise on the global stage 
as an opportunity to promote and, and represent a, a South Asian identity and South Asian interests in the global <coughs> forum. Um, with the question openly posed to India um, as to whether it would rise above itself to take on that challenge and responsibility, or would it instead, in, in its ambitions to be a global player, choose to leave South Asia behind? And of course, that begs the question, can India afford to do so? Um, if anything, the globalized nature of today's world um, seemed to compel the argument that India, in effect, cannot grow and assume its desired position on the global stage without bringing the rest of South Asia on board that growth bandwagon. Um, and to do so, it would first need to address and resolve the existing disputes um, within its, uh, 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 with its South Asian neighbors. And, and I think an, an interesting experiment in that way forward is, is what's happening on the India-Bangladesh um, relationship today. Um, uh, the final theme I wanted to touch on um, is the idea of, 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 you know, maybe reconfiguring our, our conception of South Asia um, and, and looking at prospects for sub-regional cooperation. Um, a recurrent theme across all three workshops was, of course, the question of, of SARC and why it, ha it has failed as an effective regional cooperation entity. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, a prevailing elephant in the room in that, that discussion was Pakistan and the India-Pakistan relationship that has historically hampered and, and may very well continue to hamper any future regional cooperation framework, whether that emerges within, from within the SARC structure or, or independently um, um, of it. Um, more intriguingly, perhaps, and, and certainly so in the context of this project, is where those discussions then led vis-a-vis -vis thinking not only about cooperation efforts and opportunities within the region, but also about possibly redefining our tr traditional notions um, of the region's geographic boundaries. Um, as, as more than one person um, proposed, perhaps South Asia needs to move beyond its, its SARC definitions to a concept of Southern Asia that um, you know, maybe begins its borders from the near side of the Afghanistan-Pakistan um, border and extends its boundaries to include um, um, uh, Myanmar and Southeast Asia. Um, and perhaps such a redefinition would offer more and, and better, um, not to mention more effective opportunities for cooperation at a sub-regional level. Um, and in fact, we're, we're already witnessing movement um, in this direction, not only within South Asia's traditional boundaries, um, example vis-a-vis sub-regional cooperation among select bilateral, trilateral, or, or even quadrilateral groupings within, um, uh, among South Asian states, um, but also among countries that are straddling two or more traditionally defined um, regions. And, and, you know, again, here BIMSTEC is an example of that, which is viewed by many pr proponents as a more flexible and um, effective model for trans-regional or, or, or sub-regional cooperation. So I, I just thought I'd throw out some of these teasers um, that came out of the three, three workshop exercises as food for thought. And, and with that, I'll hand it over to, to Roy. Well, it's my job to uh, set the scene and, and make sure we get through the presentation so we have a good discussion. Um, I'm not a specialist on South Asia. Uh, my background is in Northeast Asia and China in particular. Uh, my role in the project was really to help facilitate this experiment we did in non-traditional, uh, in, in employing uh, scenario, future scenarios as a way of uh, drawing out implications for current policy approaches. Um, and uh, in that light, I'd maybe make a couple, couple three comments um, before introducing the speakers. First, it was remarkable to me the degree to which we had high-level participation among our South Asian colleagues. In particular, we were talking last night at our project team dinner. In Colombo, Sri Lanka, I gathered in a, in a room of about 20 people, included uh, three former secretary generals of SARC, five former foreign secretaries in respective countries, and four ambassadors, um, two of whom were serving at that point. Very high-level group which I think speaks to the second point, which was uh, a real sense of urgency and passion to address these looming non-traditional security challenges in their own right and for the reasons that Mahin suggested 
uh, as a pathway to perhaps uh, better traditional security cooperation along the way. Um, there are, though, and, and my third quick point is there are areas of th that our project left unexplored, and perhaps chief of these, as we discussed last evening, is the, the topic of subnational cross-border cooperation uh, between states of states. And I'm hoping in this regard that we'll be able, if not during his presentation, perhaps during the Q&A, to hear some of Ambassador Kareem's thoughts on this very topic, given the work that he's been doing um, with uh, Bangladesh and, and India from his posting in Delhi. Um, personally, it's been a treat and a, and a thrill to be a part of this group and to participate with these folks over these last three years. Uh, um, we were getting a little nostalgic and sentimental last night as we remembered uh, our, our, our adventures along the way. And so thanks to this group who has participated and to the others that who are not represented here today. Thanks also to Jeff and Bob and your colleagues here at the Wilson Center for, for welcoming us here today. Um, we'll proceed in the, in the order of the program as you have it there. Uh, first, Dennis Paragis who is Dean's Professor of Government in the Department of Political Science at the University of Nevada, um, who has been involved in this project from the very beginning in a, in a conceptual way uh, and really helped to articulate the ecological security framework that we applied to the, to the project. He'll discuss the general context of non-traditional security challenges confronting South Asia. And then we'll move directly to regional perspectives. Uh, first will be uh, Malika Joseph, who is the executive director of the Regional Center <clears throat> for Security uh, for Strategic Studies in Colombo, she was uh, formerly the director of the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in New Delhi, uh, and was in that capacity that she participated in the three workshops. And she'll be sharing with us uh, thoughts uh, from the perspective of India vis-a-vis -vis the project. She'll be followed by uh, Amal Jayawardene, who is. Professor in the Department of uh, International Relations at the University of Colombo. He is Malika's predecessor as Executive Director for the Regional Center uh, for Strategic Studies in Colombo. He was our host for the second year uh, workshop in 2010 in Colombo, and he'll present perspectives uh, from Sri Lanka. And then the third regional presentation will be offered by Ambassador Tariq Karim, uh, who is currently Bangladeshi's. Bangladesh's High Commissioner to India. Uh, he first became involved with this initiative when he was uh, Vice President of the think tank in Dhaka, uh, known as the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute. And uh, BEI was our host for the first workshop in 2009. And then finally, uh, Richard Matthew, who is the founding director for the Center uh, for Unconventional Security Affairs at the University of California, Irvine will offer his thoughts on implications for the United States. Um, Richard played the role in two of the workshops as the red teamer, um, offering alternative analysis to the alternative approaches that we had uncovered in, in uh, those workshops. And uh, he's been a valuable and valued member of the team uh, uh, along the way as well. With that, we've asked each of our presenters to offer about 15 minutes of comments. And Dennis, we will start with you. Good morning. <clears throat> I should give you a warning in beginning uh, that my voice is a little different than it used to be uh, when I lived in this area five years ago. And since then, I've moved uh, to Las Vegas. And one of the penalties you pay for moving is that your voice goes up uh, a couple of notches uh, from what it used to be. So if you uh, can't stand my newfound accent, uh, just rap on the table and I'll try and do it over again. Anyway, this actually uh, is an anniversary moment. Uh, I don't know if Jeff remembers this or not, but uh, I don't know if this is very room or not, but uh, I was a speaker in one of Jeff's very early uh, presentations that was done here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, so this is kind of a return of sorts. And uh, thank you for the invitation, Jeff. Anyway, my, pre my presentation today uh, is really supposed to be designed to talk 
uh, about what these alternative ways of looking at security might be all about and what they mean uh, for the future of South Asia. I'm going to take what might be called the short-term future of the region, and by that I mean things that we can expect to happen uh, over the next 10 years or roughly up to the year 2020. Uh, any questions you have after I uh, bring up some of these things, feel free to ask them because there's way too much here uh, to spend the entire morning uh, talking about them. Now, the reasons that I can't speak well this morning are very simple. Uh, number one, uh, I have a horror of feeling for morning. Uh, I can't get up early. Made it this morning, however. Uh, secondly, I get a little bit awestruck by the wisdom of the people with, with whom I've been working on this project, and uh, they know a lot more about the South Asian region than I do, uh, so that's another reason that I feel a little bit uh, shy uh, about making uh, imperative statements, and uh, so I'll be trying to keep my statements uh, provable uh, as we go on uh, this morning. Now, to begin, we don't have, as you know, uh, an acceptable definition uh, of non-military uh, uh, security uh, tasks. Uh, it's been a long while since we decided that the old version of what security is all about has been under attack, but we really haven't found a way of uh, turning it into an alternative definition that makes more sense. And I guess if I had any role to play in this group, uh, I was trying to do just that, move from the old way of thinking about uh, in, uh, various types of security and moving into what I call uh, ecological security uh, over the last uh, couple of years. So let's turn, if you will, to thinking about uh, security as it has meant in the 21st century, uh, particularly in South Asian uh, countries. The traditional view of security that we've been using for a very long time uh, considers what that old view of security has meant to these countries. Traditional security uh, concerns have been the, for the protection <coughs> of land and the protection of wealth uh, through the application of military force. Essentially, that's what it's been about uh, for many decades. But unfortunately, for people using that, de that definition, a, ma a, ma a majority of our premature deaths have not come from the traditional uh, military struggles. These deaths have come from other places. All wars in the 20th century, the century we just passed through, all wars in the 20th century took only 111 million military and civilian lives. Now you may say, well, that's only a million. Uh, a million is a lot of people. And you might say, well, that's the military. They're supposed to do that. Uh, these numbers include a large number of civilians. Uh, so in the 20th century, we had 111 million combatants and civilians losing their lives in military struggle. But in addition, however, by contrast, uh, other types of security uh, are almost equal or even make more sense than our old views of security. While all the wars of the 20th century took 111 million people, if you divide that uh, figure uh, on your calculator, if you still have a calculator, if you divide that uh, figure uh, on your calculator, you'll find that that was about 1.1 million people per year uh, died uh, because of military struggle and its relatives. By contrast, however, if you look at actually the greatest <coughs> cause of these deaths, uh, it's infective disease that has been the real culprit, and this is by far and away now, the major difference of culprit, major uh, culprits when it comes uh, to premature deaths uh, from unusual causes. So wars, 1.1 million a year. Uh, what about uh, 
uh, infective diseases uh, and other things of that nature. In reality, between 14 and 15 million people f uh, for year, per year are actually dying because of infectious disease. So 1 million for the military definition, 14 million for the alternative, and that is uh, infectious disease. It's clear that enhancing security then uh, means much more than preparing uh, for military battles. If you really want to get away from military deaths you have, and get to some other source, the best place to start uh, is with uh, your uh, infectious disease. Now, my view of ecological security or security uh, is based on this fact. I see security as broken up into four dimensions of security. And my dimensions are defined as having a dynamic equilibrium in each of the four relationships uh, that compose ecological security, as I call it. Why do I call it economic dis uh, why do I call it economic, economic liberalism? Or pardon me, why do I call them uh, economic relationships uh, to become ecologically secure? Why dynamic equilibrium? Dynamic equilibrium because the world is always in flux. You can never find a perfect uh, <coughs> definition uh, of uh, battle or combat or military security uh, if you expect to keep it in one place. So this is why it's necessary over time to keep uh, recovering from the old defin definitions of security and thinking about more when you think about uh, the future security uh, of Asia. So with the small, time, uh, small amount of time uh, that remains to me, let me say a few things about <coughs> ecological security, referring to four types of ecological uh, <coughs> uh, equilibrium. And this is an equilibrium between human societies and uh, there are several challenges uh, to ecological security. Human security and pathogenic micro and microgenic, excuse me, human societies and pathogenic microorganisms uh, are the first dimensions of social security uh, that I think of when I think of ecological security. That is, we need to maintain a uh, solidity between uh, infectious diseases over here and uh, in, in uh, uh, societies over on this side. And that means then uh, that keeping security, ecological security, means keeping an equilibrium between human societies and uh, infectious diseases. The second dimension of this ecological security uh, that's very important right now is maintaining a relationship that is solid between human societies and other types of animals. Now, you might not think that's important, but just remember things uh, like plagues or other types of diseases that strike <coughs> other animals that are dealing with human societies. The first I should mention, uh, the relationship uh, between human societies uh, and uh, infectious diseases, uh, that relationship, uh, when it uh, moves or when it's overcome, uh, you wind up uh, with the rapid spread uh, in an ecologically uh, diverse world. You wind up with a rapid spreading of diseases to various parts of the world. Um, in addition to that, uh, you have the problem of a society in disequilibrium clashing with nature's resources. Now, there's no good way to say it except to say that human societies often don't have enough oil. Uh, natural na uh, societies don't often have enough food, water, or any of the other resources of nature. So that would then uh, be... Uh, sort of the next dimension 
uh, of uh, an ecological security. And last but not least, our fourth dimension of ecological security uh, would be called the demographic dimension. That's very much like our typical security dimension that we use in the military, and that simply means that if one society gets much larger than the other, you have disequilibrium there, and you have uh, a series of problems that we often call warfare. So in my world, that's what ecological security is all about. Four dimensions between human societies and various forms of nature, and in addition to those equilibria, uh, we have various consequences uh, if those equilibria should break down. Okay, uh, between now and the year 2025, only a short time, there's going to be a major challenge to our ecological security. We're already seeing it develop, particularly in South Asia. Uh, populations are growing rapidly. For example, Afghanistan has a population growing at 2.8% a year. Pakistan, 2.1% a year. And the Maldives, although no, though nobody seems to care at the moment, the Maldives are growing at 2% uh, a year. In terms of numbers, as you know, uh, India has more uh, than a billion human beings. Pakistan, 230 million. Bangladesh with 183 million. So in terms of first dimension uh, of ecological security, demographic security is obviously uh, at the top of the list. Now in addition to growth and demand for resources, countries with massive populations are likely to experience conflicts uh, due to youth bulges, uh, which uh, at large are numbers of young people in societies trying to find employment. Now three years ago or so we didn't talk about youth bulges. Uh, today you can't have a dis uh, discussion of things that you would call uh, demographic security without talking about uh, <coughs> demographic youth bulges. And that's simply because younger people, 15 and older let's say, uh, large numbers of people without jobs uh, tend to be rust, uh, very restive and cause many of the conflicts uh, that we see in uh, South Asia. Perhaps the largest current and future challenge to ecological security, as I mentioned before, is infectious disease. Not only South Asia has a long history of disease, but it is spreading rapidly to experiencing new diseases, particularly in an era of increasing uh, globalization. More diseases and more rapid incidence of diseases will lead to new types of disease challenge. Again, a factor related to the increasing globalization of our planet. Now I think, although I'm not looking at my watch, I think I have about three minutes left, which I will try and cap by speculating a little bit about what monitoring ecological security means uh, in an era of ecological security moving toward the year 2025. Rapid population growth in South Asia will challenge further natural resources and floods as well as challenging our water supplies and food. S supplies could become short because of periodic floods. Now I imagine all of you in this room are now believers, uh, that is you've seen enough evidence, particularly uh, in South Asia, uh, that global warming or climate change uh, is underway. And if you trace the recent history of South Asia, by the last five, six, or seven years, you can see many concrete examples of precursors to the wild types of floods that can be expected more frequently uh, in South Asia as global warming becomes a much more observable fact. Climate change uh, in the greenhouse effect, the greenhouse warming, will dramatically change South Asia 
all of the existing problems that now exist will be multiplied many times over during the next decade. Now, some scientific observers have looked at a country like Bangladesh and called it the scientific devil's workshop uh, because it already has uh, so many atmospheric <coughs> curses uh, and so far. But briefly putting it, you can expect more and more deadly floods in the future. You can find rising sea level, which will drive people from the coast into the interior of many of these countries. And that means large scale migration is going to become much more dominant and much more uh, actual in this coming 10 year period. We'll even things, see things like the melting of snow very rapidly in the mountains to the north. And uh, we need to pre prepare for that type of snowfall because many of the minerals found in the water coming down from the mountain are going to be very, very uh, deadly minerals indeed. Given the problem then, we have already seen through this project the beginning of very cooperative efforts to prepare for the year 2025 and 2050 so that these countries will be ready. And it's been my experience that these countries are often much more ready uh, than other countries, even the United States. These countries also engage in cooperative efforts uh, to prepare for the difficult efforts that will be needed uh, to keep this region solid over the next 25 to 50 years. Having said that, my imagination tells me uh, that I've gone 16.5 minutes and uh, I'll turn it over uh, to the next speaker. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Malika. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Roy. Uh, first, let me begin by thanking uh, NBR for um, letting me be part of this very interesting and very timely study on um, the futuristic scenarios in South Asia. I, I for one, totally enjoyed being part of this um, exercise. Also, thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, giving us the forum to, uh, to share what uh, we have come up with. Um, but personally, I feel very honored and happy to have Steve Cohen here, someone who uh, I worked with uh, since 1997 um, while I was with the IPCS. So I feel very happy to uh, have you, sir. And you listening there is uh, actually having a, I'm going through a lot of stress, wondering how you're going to assist me. So, but I'm personally happy that uh, you are here with us. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flag some of uh, about th uh, three uh, challenges that India faces in the next um, decade or so and how that affects its um, security paradigm in the region and it will more or less mirror what uh, Mahin had already uh, talked about what Dennis has flagged so uh, please bear with me if it's the same issue which is coming about on and off but I'm trying to try and contextualize it within uh, the Indian um, uh, center context. So uh, at any given point, uh, India faces a plethora of non-traditional security deficits. Therefore, it is extremely challenging to narrow down and put about three or four in the table for you here. And the challenge is further compounded by the fact that these security deficits and threats are interconnected. And if that was not enough, many of the challenges which we have grown up understanding as uh, non-traditional security challenges have now migrated to being termed as traditional security threats and the line dividing them continues to blur. Probably India's national security advisor, Mr. Shishankar Menon, was faced with a similar dilemma of, categorizing, uh, of categorization while addressing a congregation meeting to discuss non-traditional security challenges in New Delhi uh, last month. While on the one hand, he questions the constant temptation to securitize each issue and actually ridicules the narratives on human security. His own suggestion is to adopt categories based on the kind of response a state needs to adapt for mitigating that particular challenge. He says, I quote, from a practitioner's point of view, I find it better to distinguish between security issues amenable to the application of hard power, those less so, and those which are not. Along this continuum, non-traditional security challenges 
would be those that require the mixed application of hard and soft power, where solutions are not so clear as victory and defeat, and where problems mutate into more benign forms. They would also include those which do not respond to the application of hard power, such as food security. He goes further to say, I quote, these are domains where the combination of intent and capability mean that the nature and definition of the threat is necessarily subjective. And the perception management becomes an extremely important part of both the challenge and the response, end of quote. Well, none of this actually helped us in determining what parameters do we undertake to identify and classify the various forms of security challenges, has it? Mr. Menon's suggestion is not to get fixated on categorizing the threats, but rather use our efforts in identifying which are the ones that need our immediate attention. He points out, I quote again, it is easy to do, to do a catalog of all the threats that we would be worrying about. The broader our definition of security is, the longer the list of challenges. But how do we choose which ones we should worry about and concentrate our effort on? The traditional answer is that we should concentrate on those of strategic significance to ourselves, end of quote. I tend to agree with this oversimplified definition because at the end of the day, due to the limited resources that are available in India's disposal, we will be forced to choose and prioritize our security challenges. And quite naturally, the challenges that will consume the attention of the Indian policymaker are those that will seriously affect India's capacity to be a global power worth reckoning. These challenges may be traditional, non-traditional, zero-sum game, non-zero-sum game, requiring exercise of hard power or soft power. But at the end of the day, these will be strategic challenges that will make or break India. In this context, what are the three things that will determine India's future? It will be India's capacity in the following three areas, economy, human resources, and institutions. Basically, money, people, and institutions. Things that challenge the capacity in these three areas are most certainly to be termed as strategic challenges in the Indian context. Let's start with economy. India's economy is the ninth largest in the world by nominal GDP and the third largest by purchasing power parity. The country is one of the G20 major economies. Its economic growth is projected at 10%, and as of March 12, there were 48 Indians in the Forbes list of billionaires. But as is well known, these, these are just one side of the coin. On the other, you will find 40% of India still living below the poverty line. And on per capita basis, India ranks 128th in the world. It is this gap between the rich and the poor, which is ever increasing despite sustained economic growth, which will determine India's future. As inequality grows, it will result in unequal opportunities, income disparities, and further polarization of the rich and the poor. Compounding this problem is the uneven economic growth even within the country. Greater connectivity and enhanced media coverage has been followed by greater expectations, worse disappointments, and social unrest. The dissatisfaction that the poor experience has manifested itself in various forms, most significantly through the Naxalite violence raging all through India's resource-rich heartland. Chronic misgovernance and total administrative apathy to the development needs of the marginalized communities have resulted in pockets of acute human security deficit. Intervention by left extremists purporting to support the cause of the downtrodden has worsened the situation. While consecutive state strategies has been to address the symptom rather than the disease itself, what was earlier a deficit of human security has morphed itself into a situation where the state now faces a security deficit. Unless the state consciously tries to close the gap between the rich and the poor and is able to reach the benefits of its economic growth to its one billion, economic, India's economic growth will seriously be challenged. It will continue to spend huge amounts of uh, money in managing these conflicts. According to a study undertaken in 2006 to determine the cost of conflict in India, it was estimated that India spends nearly 150,000 crores to maintain half a million troops in Kashmir. The cost of public administration in JNK is three times more than any other state. The grant in aid in conflict zones is 10 times, and in certain cases, even 20 times higher than the national average. If India is to emerge as a global player, it needs to have a sustained economic growth. And unfortunately, the internal security situation currently poses a serious challenge to India's economic capability and capacity. 
Following money or, or economics, the next big factor that will determine India's success is its people, its demography. Demographers often say that population change is like a glacier. It moves slowly, but it has a big impact. Well, it is well known how the glacier is position, uh, positioned in the Indian context. Demographers project that India and Africa will account for most of the population growth uh, out to 2025, while less than 3% of the growth will occur in the West, primarily Europe, Japan, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The largest increase, as Dennis pointed out, will occur in India, representing about one-fifth of all growth. India's population is projected to climb by around 240 million by 2025, reaching approximately 1.45 billion people. Population trends by themselves are neither inherently good or bad, but they do create conditions for peace or conflict within which states must respond. Depending on a state's ability to draw on its population resources, any population trend, including growth, decline, or migration, could be either a challenge or an opportunity. Is India prepared to address the challenges or reap the benefits of the opportunity that the youth bulge offers? I'm afraid the answer is no. So what are the implications of the population growth at the macro and micro level? The annual level of net immigration would have to double or triple to keep working age populations from shrinking in Western Europe. This, off this offers immense opportunities for India and other South Asian countries with a similar projected youth bulge to supply to rising demands for skilled labor and professionals. The emergence of new economic tigers by 2025 could occur where youth bulges mature into worker bulges. Experts argue that this demographic bonus is most advantageous when the country provides an educated workforce and a business-friendly environment for investment. How far is India equipped in converting its youth bulge into a worker bulge? By 2025, much of India's workforce growth will come from the most poorly educated, impoverished, and crowded districts of rural northern India. This is primarily because of the demographic duality that exists in India. Already we have seen the arrival of whole communities, Hindi speaking, unskilled laborers looking for work in the South. To what extent will this migration affect the domestic political discourse in India? Demography is a multiplier. If a state has weak governance, demography can exacerbate uh, conditions for instability. Demography can also be a multiplier for other governance trends, particularly democratization. When people move, <coughs> so do their politics. Clashes of identity and interest may lead to conflict, or at a minimum, create deep social divisions. In the Middle East and Africa, migration, including internal displacement, itself is often conflict-driven. The millions displaced by trouble in, uh, troubles in Sudan, Iraq, and elsewhere potentially carry their domestic political skirmishes across borders and threaten to disrupt those regions further. In Central Asia and Middle East, movement of people is upsetting a delicate demographic balance among tribes and religious sects. Western countries will face similar challenges when drawing in the youth or youth, youth a worker bulge from South Asia. Have they planned for it? For these questions, I do not have answers. But there is an opportunity for the supply as well as the demand side to prepare adequately for this. The window of opportunity will not remain long, and both sides need to get to their drawing boards at the earliest to plan for the glacier. Finally, the importance of institutions. Their significance in the context of India cannot be understated. At one level, there is a crying need for strong institutions within the country that can capitalize on economic opportunities that are becoming available. Fiscal reforms and institutional reforms are imperative if India has to catapult itself to another level of global power dynamics. At the moment, there is a great mismatch between Indian economic potential and its capacity to deliver, and the problem lies with its institutions. But I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the lack of a cooperative security framework in the region and the role it could play in addressing the capacity gaps that exist not just in the region, but more particularly for India. Regional security architectures, not in our region alone, but elsewhere, suffer from the growing trend and preference to bilateralism over multilateral negotiations. As a result, we see in the region a maze of dyads of multilateral relationships. India, Afghanistan, India, Nepal, India, Bhutan, India, Maldives, India, Sri Lanka. Note the centrality of India in all these relationships, except Pakistan, Afghanistan. All other bilateral relationships that might exist between other South Asian countries impinge on their relationship or dynamics with India. Because of its size and simply because of geography, 
India needs to play a more central, read cooperative and accommodative role in creating and sustaining a regional architecture for this region. Overlapping these regional dyads are the bilaterals that countries in the region have with external regional powers, particularly US and China. If I were to dumb down the extremely complex foreign policy equations in the region, this is how I see them. China's engagement with most countries in the region is aimed at managing India within the region. The US engagement with countries in the region are aimed at balancing China, the fallout of which is strategic space for India. As, as with the inter-regional diets, the underlying variable in bilateral relationships with extra-regional powers remains India. This again behoves that India takes the lead in creating a security architecture that not, that not just caters to strategic compulsions, but also addresses the security concerns and challenges of its neighbors. If bilateralism has to give way to multilateralism, there is a need to incentivize Indian active participation in a regional security architecture. This will be the first step in making India accountable to its region, uh, to its neighborhood. For India, the route to being an Asian power or a global power needs to start at home in South Asia. And this process needs to be an inclusive one, taking on board all the South Asian countries. Any framework that does not include Pakistan or isolates it, isolates it will not work. Fortunately, there is much realization of this in India and steps are being taken to positively engage with its neighbors. However, there's still a long way to go. It is important that cooperative security must find a common strategic purpose. It can do so by seeking and identifying complementarity and rationalization between existing cooperative security organizations without necessarily leading to this disbanding of any one of them. So what role are we talking about for India? There is no gain saying that India has a larger and more central role to play in developing a security architecture for South Asia. It is the elephant in the room, and instead of looking at it as an issue, it is time the South Asian neighbors see how best this can be used to their advantage, be it economic growth or technological advancement. Simply because of its size, India needs to adopt a more accommodative role in the region. It needs to share more than it can get in return in tangible terms. As I mentioned earlier, for India, the route to being an Asian power or a global power needs to start at home in South Asia. Can India confidently say that if there was an international crisis in a multinational forum, all its neighbors will vote with India? Do we have that leverage? Not at this moment. At the same time, can countries in the region confidently bank on Indian support in international forum? I don't think the answer is yes. Countries in the region need to work for this, India perhaps a little more than the others. For India, its power lies in its developmental model. And as a recent work on Indian foreign policy pointed out, I quote, the fundamental source of India's power in the world is going to be the power of its example. If India can maintain high growth rates, leverage that growth to enhance the capabilities of all its citizens and maintain robust democratic traditions and institutions there are few limits to India's global role and influence. The foundations of India's success will therefore depend on its own developmental model. It needs to be more of a hedging power, uh, to be less of a hedging power and more of a bridging power. There have also been discussions on whether consensus is a feasible and desirable element in Indian foreign policy. I would say the key words need to be consistent and credible. This is what our neighbors would be looking for from us. I'd like to conclude with what the authors of Non-Alignment 2.0, a recent publication on Indian foreign policy said. India should not just aim at being powerful. It should set new standards of what the powerful must do. Thank you. Thank you, Malika. Amal. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I'm very happy to be here. And I participated in uh, all the three workshops conducted by uh, NBR, uh, that was a very successful exercise, I would say, um, because uh, through its uh, scenario analysis, it gave a new perspective of uh, how, to, uh, how to arrive at the solution of problems through new thinking. And I think finally one point uh, became very clear that was really, uh, while recognizing that there are uh, problems in interstate relations in South Asia, despite all these problems, unless we adopt a cooperative approach, uh, other problems cannot be solved. 
It is not because there are two nuclear powers in South Asia, but there are more pressing problems, non-traditional security issues, and the resolution of that would require a cooperative approach. I think that was one lesson uh, which uh, came very clear through these uh, workshops. Um, here, uh, I'm going to give you a, a small country perspective uh, on these issues, and I would select three issues. But one is energy, health issues, and the youth unrest. Uh, speaking of energy, there is a desperate need for more and more sources of energy in all South Asian countries. It is not due to the lack of secure sources of en energy in the region, but due to the failure to harness and utilize the existing sources of energy. And also due to the lack of uh, long-term energy planning in South Asia. Now, for example, Nepal's hydropower uh, potential is about 83,000 megawatts. That is uh, enough for the entire region. However, the harnessed power is less than 700 megawatts. And as a result, Nepal suffers from nearly 14 hours of power cuts during the winter. And this is not unique to Nepal, and other countries also have this problem. Uh, speaking of Sri Lanka, there has been a growing demand for energy in Sri Lanka with the steady economic growth, particularly after the end of three decades long war. During the war period, the economic <coughs> growth rate averaged around 5%, and after the war, it is around 8%. In the war-ravaged areas in the north and east, the present economic growth rate is around 22%. By the end of 2007, the national electrification level has increased to 80% of households. And I think this is considered a significant achievement in comparison to other countries in the region and the target uh, is to provide 100% households <coughs> by the end of 2015. Thus, the main challenge is how to provide a continuous and reliable energy supply at a price affordable to the consumers. In 2009, the total installed capacity was about 2,683 megawatts. The electricity demand in the year 2020 would be around 5,900. So how to bridge this gap? The problems are really, during the last 15 years, electricity generation through hydropower has been reduced drastically. And the country is increasingly dependent on imported energy sources, petroleum and coal. There has been a rapid increase in petroleum prices in the re recent past. Therefore, high cost of electricity generation is a major problem. Secondly, Sri Lanka has not sufficiently used non-conventional renewable energy sources. For example, Sri Lanka presently produced only three megawatts of wind power. Sri Lanka can emulate India in this regard. The total installed wind power capacity in India in 2010 is about 12,000 megawatts. Now, Sri Lanka's location to the equator uh, is very important. There is not much uh, seasonal variation in radiation over the island. Therefore, these are the type of uh, sources Sri Lanka can uh, harness uh, to fulfill the national demand. Uh, now, when it comes to energy problem in South Asia, it cannot be uh, solved through national efforts only. I think there has to be regional cooperation. For example, uh, the construction of uh, India-Sri Lanka electricity grid or interconnection is underway. This electricity transmission line between Madurai and, uh, and uh, via Pork Strait towards uh, Anuradhapura at the at the cost of uh, US uh, dollars 400 30 million, and this is underway. Uh, in other words, uh, this will enable Sri Lanka to enter the regional power trading market 
so the electricity at a cheaper price could be purchased. Uh, <coughs> now there is a grid connection between India and Bhutan, and there is a proposed uh, natural gas pipelines connecting Burma, Bangladesh, and India, and then uh, through Iran, uh, from Iran, Pakistan, and India, and also there is a proposal to build a power line between India and Nepal, but unfortunately these are only proposals. Unless these proposals are implemented, there is uh, very difficult. Uh, there is very. Uh, I mean, it is very difficult to uh, attain uh, self-sufficiency in energy in South Asia. And also, there are other things to do now. For example, there are good practices in other regions. Uh, now, for example, uh, EU has signed an energy charter because this is a, uh, th there. There has to be a South Asia energy charter because. The, the major problem for investors in the region is the lack of, uh, uh, lack of uh, safety for investments and because of the regime changes, uh, there are, I mean, people are hesitant uh, to have secure investments. Therefore, in order to generate you know, confidence-building measures, it is high time that South Asian countries should also sign an energy charter. Now, uh, when it comes to nuclear power, uh, well, of course, India and Pakistan have been traditional users of uh, nuclear power, uh, nuclear energy uh, to generate power, and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have expressed the uh, desire to harness uh, nuclear energy, but of course, after the Fukushima disaster, Sri Lanka has uh, more or less given up this uh, hope. However, the fact that even if Sri Lanka doesn't have nuclear uh, power, it does not uh, mean that Sri Lanka is safe. Because in southern India, uh, the area called uh, Kudankulam, India has a, uh, has a cluster of nuclear uh, plants. So in case of any accident, what will happen? Therefore, there is a need to sign a MOU between Sri Lanka and India uh, to, de to design measures uh, to take care of a nuclear accident. Uh, therefore, there is a need for regional nuclear disaster management agency in South Asia. Uh, well, well, of course, uh, one might uh, say that uh, one might say that uh, <coughs> these these are. Im uh, I mean, it is very uh, difficult to uh, practice these or implement these ideas. Uh, because of the mistrust exists between nations. Mm, but I think our workshop series uh, also came to the conclusion that uh, the, the knowledge generated through these workshops, I think we should uh, give this, we should uh, disseminate this among the youth, because uh, unless you change the mindset of uh, the young people, it is, it is difficult to implement these ideas. Now, also uh, referring to energy, I should say that, uh, the global problems also uh, matter a lot. Now, for example, um, U.S. sanctions on Iran. Now, in, in Sri Lanka's case, uh, our petroleum, uh, 90, you know, we have only one refinery, that is Sapugaskanda, uh, which refine 50,000 barrels a day, but 93% of energy or pe uh, petroleum products are imported from Iran. And this is a refinery you can't uh, refine other countries' oil, really. It is only except for Saudi Arabia and Oman. So therefore, at the moment, Sri Lankan government is negotiating with these countries. Uh, however, 93% uh, of petroleum imports to this refinery are from Iran. Um, therefore, these are also, because uh, uh, if there are uh, gas shortages in the, in, the, in the country, then there will be you know, massive demonstrations and all these things. So I would uh, like to you know, point out the importance of uh, this fact also. Uh, then, uh, let me go to the health sector. Actually, despite the uh, low level of economic growth, Sri Lanka has achieved a number of noteworthy successes in the area of health security. Infant mortality rates and fertility rates have dramatically declined. The, um, and um, among the countries in South Asia, Sri Lanka has the 
highest life expectancy and also the literacy rate increased from 57 point in 1946 <coughs> to 95 point uh, six percent in 2001. Now during the 20th century Sri Lanka largely succeeded in the priority areas of the provision of maternal and child uh, health and Sri Lanka has been cited as a success story in South Asian countries. However, the demographic transition, due to the uh, demographic transition, the relative proportion of the population over 60 years have increased dramatically. Uh, therefore, this aging population, as you know, there are, uh, because a traditional home care system has been eroded, it has eroded even in Sri Lanka. Therefore, the government has to make provision to take care of this uh, aging population in Sri Lanka. And also, uh, Sri Lanka has succeeded in uh, combating <coughs> uh, communicable diseases. However, again, like in any other society, Sri Lanka's non-communicable diseases, the rate of non-communicable diseases um, uh, has increased dramatically. Uh, now, on the other hand, uh, Sri Lanka's investment, the government's expenditure on health and education has been around 2% for the uh, you know, last uh, half a century. And at that time, this was sufficient because the, in order to take care of those basic problems, that is to eradicate communicable diseases and to provide maternal and child health care system. But presently, that is not sufficient. Uh, like in any, uh, you know, South Asian countries, the defense expenditure has uh, increased uh, considerably. Even though the war has uh, come to, uh, you know, war has come to an end, uh, there is no peace dividend in that sense. I mean, the, the defense expenditure remains still the same. And uh, if, if the ethnic problem can be permanently solved in Sri Lanka, we hope that uh, a certain percentage of uh, defense expenditure can be converted into other areas like health and education. My third point is the youth problem, but one, I, you know, Sri Lanka, even though Sri, uh, comparative to, I mean, compared to other countries in Sri Lanka, there isn't a huge uh, youth bulge. However, in Sri Lanka, there were uh, three insurgencies, two insurgencies in the south, and also the other insurgency in the north, that is, that is the Tamil youth movement. Now, the youth played a very important role in all these events. Uh, one, one remark I should like to make is that uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, we had uh, free, uh, 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 up to the university, education was free, and therefore uh, this created, uh, this gave access even to the very uh, rural people to get education. However, there are other inequalities, and therefore there is this uh, rural youth unemployment is very high in Sri Lanka. Uh, having said that, I should emphasize these youth problems cannot be reduced only to economic problems like unemployment. Uh, youth being the youth, they expect other things. Therefore, if you want to take care of youth problems, uh, you also have to introduce, as Malika said earlier, institutional reforms like good governance, uh, transparency, and, um, and also uh, how to eradicate corruption. Uh, these, these, the, with, with, without these institutional reforms and without having good governance, it is difficult to solve youth problems. I think I have taken my time. Uh, maybe when you ask questions, I will answer. Thank you. Ambassador Kareem. Thank you, Roy. Uh, first of all, uh, my gratitude and congratulations to NBR and to uh, Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, co-hosting this and giving us an opportunity to be here with my very, very distinguished friends and colleagues from South Asia who participated in this project. Um, I would like to first of all, put out the standard disclaimer. I do hold an official position, but I am here purely in my personal capacity, and my views do not necessarily reflect 
the views of the government of, Pakistan, uh, of Bangladesh, nor does the government adhere to or share any of those. So I, ho I hope that this will not be attributed to the government of Bangladesh. First of all, I would like to, uh, reviewing what we have gone through over the last three years, uh, try and make an assessment of whether this project which we engaged in was useful. And my uh, spontaneous response to that is definitely yes. Uh, part of the reason is because it took such a different approach to looking at issues and problems. We all know what the problem is today. And we all know something about the problem's genesis. If, if anything, we tend to dwell very deeply into the genesis, genesis and very long, but then we run out of steam and don't go beyond. Very few of us actually get around to extrapolating today's challenges into what dimensions they are likely to assume 15, 20, or 25 years hence. And that is, that is where I think is a major flaw in policy making uh, in governments all over, because typically governments think in five-year uh, slots of time. As a result, policy formulators as well as policy executors mostly focus on short-term pro prognosis rather than engaging in anticipatory thinking for the long term. This project forced participants to look into a virtual South Asia, South Asian world in 2025 that was extrapolated from the scenario presented to them by Professor Dennis Piragius. A testimony to the success in forcing participants to actually think differently was evidenced by the fact that progressively, from phase one to phase two to ultimately phase three, initial skeptics had actually graduated to seriously thinking outside the box about how to reach the goal set out in the extrapolated scene. This clarifies our thoughts and sharpens our focus on the present in seeking to identify the drivers that we need to reach our goals a decade or more later. What would be, I don't want to go into a lot of the, the actual uh, methods and, and the goals that's been explained elaborately by Mahin and uh, the country perspectives have been dealt with by others. I'm going to dwell on how Bangladesh then fits into whatever we were doing. Bangladesh has a small and finite landmass, but an ever-growing population. It has the highest population density per square kilometer, uh, square kilometer in the world today. And despite steady growth over the last 15 years or so, uh, five years for over more than two decades, and about 6, .6 to 6.3, 6 uh, targeting 6.7 in the last three years, so that's nothing to be sneezed at. But it also has a sizable part of its population below the poverty line. Lifting these people above this line while engaging in sustained economic development that is also econo ecologically sustainable will continue to have to be the priority goals for government. However, all efforts could be st stymied by any of the following challenges. Worsening environmental conditions, and Dennis has elaborated some of them, uh, most notably for us, global warming resulting in sea level rise, uh, and unpredictable weather patterns. Additionally, uh, retreating glaciers in the Himalayas, which are going to affect the, the traditional flows of uh, water in the rivers, the many rivers that, go th that drain through Bangladesh into the Bay of Bengal, large-scale coastal inundations, uh, with, with this double whammy situation of uh, reduction in the flow of water and a rise in the sea level, the equilibrium between the salt water and fresh water is going to be adversely affected, with salt water pushing its way more and more inland. That, of course, will mean uh, pH factor of the soil will change, agricultural patterns will change, keystone species will be wiped out, and human displacements will take place. Now, this is not going to happen overnight, but this is going to happen over a period of, let's say, 5, 10, 15 years. 
uh, and typically like a, like a glacier, it keeps moving until a point comes and if governments have not, policymakers have not taken the time and the trouble to anticipate it, at some point of time this will be sitting on their heads and they won't know what to do with it. There will be tighter water supplies affecting food production, continuing energy crunch. Without fuel, a car will not run. So without power in the, in, in the lines, and the grid lines, industries will not run. Uh, this, of course, will also affect development because you cannot then keep up with your growth rate or the ambitious growth rate pro uh, plans or targets set, uh, which means uh, there will be job cuts or simply uh, uh, in um, unemployment growing. Uh, and, of course, the wildcard events. Uh, I think uh, having done this only last night and this morning, I saw the reports of the latest earthquake in Indonesia, 8.2, and the tsunami warning that has followed. Uh, Bangladesh had an earthquake uh, recently of about 4.8. New Delhi had an earthquake of about 5.6. As it happens, this is a fault line which stretches from Indonesia right down through India and across. It's the Asian plate and the Indian plate, which once they clashed, I don't know how many thousand years ago, the Himalayas formed, they are moving again. Uh, the problem is nobody knows how to predict it. Are these the precursors to the big one coming? When will the big one come? So these are unpredictable things with which nobody and I, 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 I think very few, if anybody, is actually looking at, at having to cope. Because it's not on my watch. I'll be gone. It'll happen during someone else's time. How will these affect countries' traditional security? Uh, I think, one, all these, either singly or in combination, will bring to bear increasing, perhaps even unbearable, pressure on capacity of government to cope with or manage with these crises. That's number one. And if a government cannot cope or cri uh, with a crisis, then you have all sorts of bedlam and hell-breaking news <coughs> within the country. Number two, and, and that, of course, impacts directly on security, whether internal <coughs> security or security of others who are in the neighborhood. Number two, there will be socio-political tensions domestically. That, of course, is domestic security uh, implications coming up. And then, number three, more importantly, there will be strained relations with neighbors, which, if not managed and, not con and, and if not contained, could have snowball effects. What do we need to do? In my view, I'm very clear, uh, and, and I think my thought... The, the way I look at it, where I come from, is I look at the map, I look at where Bangladesh is situated, and I can't escape my geography. My geography compels me to keep looking at that map and seeing how we can resolve our issues on our own. It's not possible. It's just not possible. We have to enter into a set of cooperative relationships with the countries immediately around us or the political entities that form parts of countries around us. <coughs> and without that, we will not be able to deal with any of the ecological uh, uh, challenges that we will be confronted with, which will translate into socio-economic and socio-political challenges that will then translate into the overall security paradigm that, that we look at in traditional uh, security. Uh, we need now to be looking at joint or coordinated management of commons. And for us, for me, in Bangladesh, the commons are hydrosphere and ecosphere. We need to seek cooperative solutions to augment power generation. Uh, Amal dealt with this. Malika has dealt with this. Without power, we will have problems. In Bangladesh, one of the constant problems is the midterm of any government the, you will hear the cacophony of voices coming up saying, no power, what's the government doing? Why are we having blackouts for five hours, six hours, or three times, or four times a day? Uh, the problem is not that power is not being added, but every time you add power, you are still way short because the power added 
fuels more activities. The fueling of more activity makes you fall short in, in what the power you need. It's, it's, a, it's a mugs game, and you can't try to keep up uh, pace with it. Of course, that is aggravated by the fact that oil supplies are, are sometimes so tenuous. We don't know what will happen if another uh, a major war breaks, breaks out, a major conf conflict breaks out in the uh, traditional hydrocarbon supply areas. Uh, we have to transition increasingly, even dramatically, to renewable energy and alternative energy, solar, biomass, nuclear and progressively reduce dependence on hydrocarbon-fired energy. We have to set up regional or sub-regional bodies with authority to regulate holistic management of water and energy resources, disaster management, food security. And we have to develop regional policies for economic development that will complement and synergize national policies and measures, legitimize legal migration, and allow redistribution of labor according to regional needs. Now, this might appear like a tall order, but from where I'm sitting and where I come from, I can tell you this, this much, without revealing state secrets, that it's already beginning to happen. I do not see the glass as half empty. I see it as more than half full. Bangladesh... India, meaning the parts of India contiguous to Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, we are in very serious and advanced stages of, of, of arriving at an agreement on sub-regional cooperation, on holistic water management, and, and holistic energy, uh, energy security uh, uh, measures. Um, Amal mentioned a couple of figures, and... You know, these, these are actually quite, quite interesting. Nepal has a potential of 83,000 megawatts. Actual production is only 700, and they can't supply electricity to themselves for about 8 to 12 hours a day. Bhutan has a potential, has a surplus potential capacity of 23,000 megawatts, and they need a maximum of 700. So this 23,000 megawatts is surplus. India has already entered into an agreement for getting 10,000. And we are looking at the remaining 10,000 or 13,000, and we'll put where our money where our mouth is, we have said. We need to, to, to extract that uh, uh, clean energy. Um, we will also need to do something like that with Nepal. We have expressed our interest. Nepal will take a slightly longer period of time because they have to resolve their own uh, political uh, problems at home first. Uh, but the fact that all four parties have said, yes, this is good, they are discussing seriously, we are already halfway to reaching our goals. Um, of course, that means you have to evacuate the power. You need to also agree to how you are going to get the power you are going to generate across. So we have also agreed in principle to integrating our grid lines. And you start with small measures, so we are doing it on our western sector with India's eastern sector in West Bengal. We will do it with Agartala, Tripura, and Bangladesh. We will do it across from Arunachal, uh, across Bangladesh, into India and into Bangladesh. We uh, have also talked about linking up the uh, Bhutanese grid line with the Indian grid line and through that with the Bangladesh grid line. So eventually, Amal, some of the things I spoke about are happening in a semi-SARC context on one side of SARC. It's not such a pie-in-the-sky thing that, that uh, initially we thought it was. Um, then you have extensions of this. Uh, you have the India, Bangladesh, Myanmar thing. We have just revived this proposal. Myanmar had backed out after first Bangladesh had backed out, and then Bangladesh said, okay, but Myanmar said we don't have enough gas. So that is going to be revived. Uh, that was perhaps in a political context. The political situation there is changing. So hopefully they will also change their minds. There is the TAPI in, uh, initiative, and Bangladesh is showing, showing an interest in that. The TAPI is the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. 
However, I foresee problems in that because the Afghanistan-Pakistan problems will, you know, how they will play out, nobody knows for sure. Even if everyone is on board, the earliest it is expected to happen, uh, actually become operationalized, will be about four years. Uh, but uh, very few of the policy, senior policymakers I've been in touch with uh, are, are optimistic about that four-year timeline. Uh, there is the Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran pipeline. Uh, this is something which they started talking about uh, the, during the time when I was posted in Iran way back in 1991, early 90s. Uh, and I, I, when I look back on it, you see, at that time when they were discussing this, uh, there was the overland route, which was going to be much cheaper, of course, but the politics intruded. And there was the underwater, uh, the, the uh, uh, undersea pipeline, which was going to be very expensive. And so everyone, you know, well, not everyone, but basically Iran and India sort of dithered on that. And now I look back and I think, well, 15 years have passed. If they had adopted the, the uh, marine pipeline, they would have done it. Today the cost would probably be 100 times more. So, you know, the, the value of anticipatory thinking can never be uh, uh, sort of... Uh, minimized or, or laughed away. The other thing that I want to touch on is uh, involving youth. I, I fully support this, and I hope that this idea will be carried forward for two reasons. We have a youth bulge across the uh, world, many parts, but more importantly, I think the demography of the electorate has changed dramatically. <coughs> You've seen some of it here. Uh, you saw it about four years ago. We saw it dramatically in the Bangladesh elections, where 40 to 45 percent of the voters were actually voting for the first time. All right, we saw it in West Bengal to some extent. We have seen it to India in a growing extent. <coughs> My, <coughs> I don't have, <coughs> excuse me, statistics about the Arab Spring, but my intuitive hunch is that it would be. Uh, not dis not dissimilar. Now, this is these are the this is the group which is going to make difference in policy making. I think over the next five, ten, fifteen years, uh, the, the the that bulge is going to be added to. It's going to expand, and this is a completely new set of voters who are coming on stream, and it is necessary. These are voters. 18 upwards to 30, who are still open to ideas, who are actually exchanging a lot of information and ideas. They are connected. They don't have need to have computers. They just talk to each other on the cell phone. You walk in Dhaka, you'll see every second person has at least one cell phone in his hand. Some have two going around. You go to the villa, and it's not an urban phenomenon. You go out outside to the peri-urban and rural areas, and that's the connectivity. They uh, do networking. It's amazing. That's going to change the nature of politics, and it's going to translate into the nature of policy formulation. And that is why it's important that exercises that this should try and go out and reach out with these ideas and suggestions to this group, because that is the critical mass we are looking at who can make policymakers uh, uh, who can force policymakers to take cognizance of these issues and address them. Uh, I'll end here and, and leave time for Q's and A's. Thank you. Thank you, Tari. Richard. All right. Um, <coughs> so, so first of all, I want to thank Mahin and, and Roy for inviting me to be part of this project. I think that the, opp the uh, opportunity to, to look ahead over 15 years is an important one. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with the with the uh, report that was really released by a group of researchers at MIT recently that sort of, that, that predicted that unsustainable uh, behavior is, is likely to trigger a global economic catastrophe in the next 15 years or so. So it may also be that this period is particularly important to look at, um, given that Asia plays prominently in, 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 their, in their prediction. 
Um, I also want to thank the, the Jeff and the Wilson Center for, for hosting this. Um, I've had the, the good fortune of being involved in a variety of activities here over the past 15 years or so. Um, the program is clearly a, a key element of this field, and it's been an important part of, of, of the development of my own career over the years, so I thank Jeff for that. Um, Hillary Clinton has been credited with saying that, that the uh, history of the 21st century will largely be written in Asia. And I think that in, in some areas, there, there's clearly a strong basis for this type of prediction. Um, Asia is poised to dominate cyberspace in, in significant ways. And, and its economy, its economic success, which looks like it's going to, to continue, clearly makes it a, 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 of, of global significance. South Asia is benefiting from this, and, and South Asia through, through you know, ha, is enjoying this, this tremendous economic growth, but it faces also a lot of challenges, and the challenges, some of them have been, have been mentioned here. I think that, that the, the possibility of, of hydrological transformation at a sort of unprecedented scale as groundwater depletion interacts with, with changes in the intensity, the timing, the, the location of the monsoon, and possible uh, changes in stream flow. Um, this, this, this is e enormous. We know that the, the area is, is warming more rapidly than, than the rest of the, uh, than the global average, and that some parts are warming extremely quickly. These are big concerns in an area that Maplecroft has identified as the, as, as the most vulnerable to disasters in the world. In fact, you know, I think Bangladesh is number one, Pakistan number four, uh, India number 11 on the Maplecroft list. Um, all of this while it's undergoing an unprecedented rapid transformation from rural to, to urban, something that we've never witnessed in history before. Um, it has a history of, 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 of violent conflict, and for a lot of people that's a predictor of, uh, that's one of the most secure predictors of violent conflict in the, in the future. So these various stressors, and that's not a complete list, and vulnerabilities um, do create the conditions for non-traditional or unconventional security threats. And I think that we can easily imagine, easily imagine um, over the next 15 years public health setbacks, for example. And not just in South Asia, but in, in other parts of the world as well. I think that, that massive gains over five decades in public health are in a very precarious position right now. Um, humanitarian crises, we've already seen the scale of these related to earthquakes and floods in the past few years. Uh, they could become ex extremely costly types of activities in the next few years. Um, and, 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 and related to those things, the, the difficult to manage flows of, of, of people, um, perhaps the, the increased connectivity and, and sophistication of extremist groups and the fusion of criminal and, and terrorist uh, activity, um, an uptick in things like cyber crime, cyber war, cyber terror, and really urban security issues that, that we're only beginning to, to, to have an inkling of, of, of the dimensions of. Um, I am not sure that these types of threats have any particular alignment with the idea of South Asia. I think that one of the things that this, this project revealed is that we're not, we, we, we don't have a simple definition of what constitutes South Asia per se. It's an interesting, it's an interesting idea, but there's disagreement over, where, over, over, over uh, you know, its, its actual boundaries. And it's not clear that however we define the boundaries, they align perfectly with, this, with the threats. So the threats are, are messy. Um, and, and the boundaries of South Asia are, mess, are messy. Nonetheless, I can, I can, I can imagine a number of, of things taking shape, a number of scenarios unfolding over the next 15 years that would be of interest uh, and significance to the United States. And clearly, clearly one possibility would be that, you know, India s succeeds in, 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 in uh, uh, stabilizing uh, tensions along its border, and it begins to work mo more closely with, with countries like China, uh, Russia, Brazil, these types of countries, and starts to, wor to, for to formulate new rules, new norms for the international system. Um, and I think that, that to the extent that that happens, I think that, the, that one domain in which that's likely to be experimented with is in the, the realm of, of cyberspace, in, in the Internet. How is that going to be regulated? What are going to become the rules that regulate the flow of information, the ownership of information, the management of information in that domain? And this is a big domain. 2.5 quintillion pieces of data are added every single day. More data has been, has been generated 
in, in, on, the, on the Internet in the past two years than in the previous two million years of human history. There's a lot of data out there, and who manages it, how it's, how it's, how it's mined, how it's regulated, is going to be enormously significant. And clearly, there are different alignments on the planet taking shape. This is important because what happens in Internet, on the, uh, you know, in cyberspace, will affect our ability to deal with public health issues or deal with economic crisis or deal with security issues, deal with climate change, deal with uh, hydrological issues. So it matters how this, how this uh, progresses. Um, if, these, if, 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 if rules start to be generated to, that, that are designed to promote order and stability and, and, and create a platform for solving problems. Of course, they may not, they may not be globalized, and we may end up you know, experiencing some new type of bipolarity or multipolarity where different rule systems start to compete, and whether that will be, will, will be something that we can, we can work out pragmatic, productive relationships with alternative rules or whether this will be a source of great tension for the U.S. and, and so on in the future is something we, we can't predict. It's also possible, of course, that the, that the framework that the U.S. established for, or for promoting order and stability in the world, the rules and, and norms that it, that it crafted uh, decades ago, will continue to be the, the, the basic architecture, and we see, we see countries like India experimenting with how far can they push trade rules, you know, can we introduce services, how far can they push this, the structure of the UN Security Council, you know, what can they do there, can they change its architecture in ways without throwing out, throwing out the whole. So it is possible that, that a set of rules and, and, and so on that we're familiar with will we'll simply learn and adapt to new needs, and that Asia will play a large role in that. Um, it's also possible that there won't be any new set of rules and norms that will end up experiencing what, MI, what the MIT researchers are predicting, chaos, you know, uh, uh, conflict, uh, collapse, and so on in the next 15 years. Um, so against this, since we don't know, what should the U.S. be doing? Well, I think that there's a number of things the U.S. should be doing uh, as we look at what, what, what the, the sort of the findings of this group over the past three years. Um, one thing, of course, is... Is is the U.S. is a is is, is has has played a, a fairly significant role in contributing to economic volatility around the world, and probably it has to it has to find some way to reduce that particular role it has been playing. It has to make it it has to get its own house in order, in, uh, you know, and become a bit more of a a, a sustainable economy that's going to inter introduce less risk and volatility into the rest of the planet. Um, so that's one thing that it probably needs to do. If it wants to, if it wants to encourage a, a, a productive relationship with growing parts of the planet, it doesn't want to be the thing that introduces risk and volatility into them. Um, it also, I think, that there's a huge need to improve social capital here. One of the things that became clear to me uh, through this project and several related projects is how 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 much discussion takes place around the need to to you know, change our energy economy or to deal with climate change or, or, or what have you, um, which is woefully uninformed about the science of these things. It, it, is, it, is really, it is really shocking. Energy is not just some fungible thing that you can replace this energy with that energy. It isn't, in fact, a single whole. It's a very complex field. There are many different types of energy which play different roles in an economy. And so when we talk about energy, we need to be a little bit more sophisticated. When we talk about climate effects in this region, we need to be using our best understanding of what science is telling us about this. And so there's a, a tremendous need here to build that social capital up, to have a, a much higher level of, 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 of science literacy, a much higher level of global proficiency of understanding these regions. If they're important to us and if we're going to interact and engage with them, we need to understand them and these issues uh, uh, better. So, we, so I think that that's, that's, that's important and that will allow us to develop the global partnerships, the global networks that can be mutually beneficial. But as long as we continue to sort of oversimplify these issues and, and pretend that there is, that, you know, nuclear power can substitute for oil or hydropower can substitute for oil, I mean, these are in a, in a way very, very crude types of discussions that, 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 that don't uh, reveal 
much understanding of how interchangeable different energy forms really, really are. And, you know, we, we hear all sorts of talk about ice and snow melt and stuff. The fact is, we do, scientists don't even know whether snow coverage is, is, is in decline in this region or not. Um, ice melt is largely, is largely understudied. There's 50,000 glaciers there. We've studied about six of them, and we have very little understanding of what's going on. We don't know about black carbon and the, and the albedo effect. We don't know whether seasonal stream flow is going to be affected. We don't understand feedback uh, mechanisms in the area. We do know global warming is taking place. We don't understand its impact on biodiversity. So we have a, a whole lot of things that we, we have to be realistic about we un what we understand before we start, pr start <coughs> mapping out their social effects and, and uh, designing <coughs> institutional responses to social effects that are based on, on, scientific, sci uh, on changes that, we, that we've sort of oversimplified. Um, I do think, so, so, so we have to build up that capacity at home. I think that'll be a, a generally beneficial to us and to everybody else in the world. Now, in terms of a more proactive role, I would say that, that the Internet is, 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 in my mind, an area of uh, incredible importance. Asia is growing in, the, in this domain much more quickly than, than, than we are. Um, and, the, and you can imagine the domain as having sort of three parts. On, uh, on the one hand, there is what we talk about, the, the sort of, and, and, and we think of Occupy Wall Street, Arab Spring, but we think of science collaboration, we think of exchanging information, we think of people, you know, maintaining transnational networks. There is this political space on the Internet which is incredibly valuable. But the Internet is largely owned by the private sector. So most of the Internet, most of the world is owned by the private sector. The private sector is developing the most sophisticated tools for handling big data. And this is largely largely being used uh, for the purposes of, of, of things like marketing and selling, selling goods and so on. Um, so you have the private sector role, you have the sort of youth politics role, and there's also this, the security role, cyber security, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, and so on. And what, what is going to be interesting is, is which of these areas sort of ends up defining the, 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 the set of rules which, which start to manage how information is shared, used, stored, conveyed, regulated on here. And it's going to make a big difference, whether, whether it's the government motivated by security concerns or whether it's the private sector motivated by business opportunities and economic growth or whether it is those people who see this as, a, as, as where we, the, the space where we can collaborate and play with new forms of, of, of political engagement and so on. And I don't think it's, I think that, that right now this, this, this issue is on the table. Asia has, Asia and South Asia have a, have a big, have, have a, are big players in discussing the future of this, and we need to be more engaged in those discussions. We are largely outside the discussions of, of, of w the future of the Internet. And this, I think, is, it means that we are outside what might be the single most important leverage point for dealing with climate change, with, with youth, with uh, public health, with these issues. This is crucially important. We're not taking it seriously. I think the other thing is, is, is you know, a more pragmatic approach to multilateralism. We keep talking about things like balancing. I think that by now we know the world's a complex place and it's hard to talk about balancing in a complex system. It, it, it doesn't make very much sense. We can, however, try and apply pressure so that, so that institutional arrangements, regional arrangements, are more or less compatible with uh, with larger arrangements like the U, U, you know, UN arrangements. We can support, I think, uh, and, and try to identify a much more vibrant role for middle powers in the region. There's the, 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 the countries like Canada and Japan and Australia have, have, a, have a presence in the region which we don't appreciate or, or work well with, um, but they often have a much finer-grained understanding of some of the local issues. Um, I think that we have to be more pragmatic in, in, in thinking through how, how forms of extremism that we're uncomfortable with might best be addressed by allowing them to be institutionalized. That's obviously been a big issue for us in Afghanistan, but we're largely alone on that issue. I think that if you look at not just the Afghan people, but other countries like Japan and Canada, they have a much more pragmatic approach to what needs to be done to reduce uh, you know, extremism there. I think that, that you know, it is hard for us to, to think about middle powers, non-state actors, but they are part of this, of this area. They have types of expertise um, that we don't have, and we need to be able to work with them more, uh, you know, 
uh, profitably than we do. What we have, which I think no other country in the world has, we may be alone in having a planetary perspective now. There may be no other country which really has the planetary perspective that the U.S. has. And, and that means that we, we, we tend to look at the whole world um, it means that we're often awkward in regional settings because our, our, our knowledge isn't as fine-grained as people who have a more regional focus. But we do see how different things interact. And very few other parts of the world are looking at how, how Asia and Africa and South America and North America and Europe all interact. We continue to, to raise that question. I think it makes us valuable in a way that we haven't, haven't fully capitalized on. Um, I want to conclude by saying that I think there's a number of, of, of wild cards. I think that one of the things that I think is that, it, that we really need to, to be thinking about is, is MIT may be right, this project may be right. We, we, we have a 10, 15-year time frame. And in that sort of time frame, certain things become more important than they might in a, if we sort of think of this as a 50-year issue. For example, who's in power at a certain time, specific personalities. Individuals become more important as you as you shorten the time frame than they do over a larger 50 or, or 60 year period. So it matters to us that we understand these people better than we than, than historically we have done. We typically sort of don't dig down to the to the to the to the level of of detail and nuance, which probably is going to be much more uh, influential in the outcomes than then, you know, when we look at things in this, at this more abstract level, that there are sort of big, broad changes taking place. We need, to, we need to supplement that understanding where we're very good with much more detailed understandings. I think that, that the, the, the a second wild card, of course, is, is, is how do, how do how, what is the, what, what happens in terms of connectivity and mobilization among those 400 million extremely poor, largely young people. I mean, how do they get mobilized? How do they get built into the system and its success, or do they not? Or do they get mobilized in a different direction? That's going to be a big challenge for India and, 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 and other countries. It's going to be something that, that could change the direction of things dramatically. Um, clearly, the, the future of, 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 of cyberspace, how it's regulated, how it's managed, is going to be important. And we know that these countries are deeply involved in those in those discussions. Um, I, my own work, which focuses on the interaction between groundwater, climate change, suggests that the, the possibility of hydrological collapse is, is, is significant in this area. And that could change everything. So if we, it, it, right now, we, have, we are for the first time seeing levels of groundwater depletion which nobody suspected and which, which are, are <coughs> deeply, deeply alarming. Um, and and uh, this, this could... This could obviously vi uh, sort of sort of resonate through the entire economy um, in very very dramatic ways over the next five or, t or ten years. So I think that, and of course, there's always the possibility of these sort of black swan events that people talk about. So I think that there's there's lots that the U.S. could be doing based on what the thinking that has come out of this project uh, about what we might what we might have to interact and engage with over the next 15 years. And it's been a pleasure to be part of it. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Well, please join me in thanking our presenters uh, for their words this morning before we uh, go into our discussion. We have about 40 minutes. Uh, what I'd propose to do would be to, to take questions in groups of three. If you would, uh, when, you, uh, when I acknowledge you, please uh, state your name and affiliation if you have one, and then if you're directing your question to a particular presenter, please make it clear at, at that point. And uh, the best thing would be if we limited our comments and really focused on asking questions of the specialists that are here with us today in the time we have left. So uh, are there those that would like to start us off? Right here is one. And then Steve. Then Steve. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, David Mickle. I'm uh, with the, the Stimson Center. I'd uh, like to thank all of the, uh, the commentators and the participants, but um, I'd like to begin by directing my questions um, uh, specifically to, to two of you, but with maybe contributions from the others. Um, first, I'm wondering if Richard could maybe share with us a couple of his uh, red team uh, analyses. I think we got a little bit of a flavor of some of them, um, but if there are particular uh, issue areas or uh, uh, 
uh, or, or um, regional questions um, which, uh, which you'd like to highlight. Um, and then the second uh, question, uh, I think, although I, I, all of the participants mentioned at one point or another, um, uh, data sharing, information sharing, and particularly the regulation uh, and contributions of cyberspace, um, I'd like to um, ask a question about governance issues in cyberspace as they relate to possible uh, impacts of, of public health challenges uh, in the future. I mean, one uh, thing that we sometimes uh, see in the United States when it's flu season um, is how you can track uh, flu outbreaks by uh, searches for pharmacies or uh, certain types of medication. Uh, and But I'm wondering if that type of data sharing might actually propose pose problems in a context of hoped for regional cooperation um, if you think back to SARS or China's um, uh, lack of uh, forthrightness um, in disclosing information about disease outbreaks, whether there could be um, concerns on the part of uh, different actors and, and regulators and, and players in the region about uh, the sharing of big data uh, on uh, public health questions that um, Bangladesh, you know, to just pick a name out of a hat without any particular ideas in mind, might be reluctant to reveal that all this connectivity with rural areas is uh, providing data on disease outbreaks, which then might spread to other areas of the world. And, um, you know, should, uh, if we release that information, maybe too early in our investigation of what the actual health threat was, that could pose you know, political or economic risks that people would come to fear that, uh, well, we shouldn't, uh, um, you know, we need to cl close down trade with, with Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or whomever, you know, for this, this time being because there's a, a looming health risk and that it was the big data uh, that, that gave us the insight into that, but maybe also raised, um, you know, un, uh, unfounded fears. Good. Thank you. We'll take two more and then ask our participants to respond. Steve, did you have? Yeah. I'm Stephen Cohen uh, at Brookings now, but was a professor for many years. Um, what I find missing is an intense discussion of the linkage between so-called conventional and so-called non-traditional security. And I think that if you go pull back, all the Professor Parash's paper touched on this, and Malika's paper quoted um, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon on this. If you pull back a little bit, really what we're talking about is justice or different con concepts of justice. And I think if you look at different kinds of states where the state is run by the military, run by civilians, they have different views of what justice is, therefore different views of what a problem is, therefore different solutions to the problem. If you give, if you give an eight-year-old boy a hammer, he'll, everything, everything looks like a nail. So I think that, that there's a sociological, you know, political problem here. Ambassador Kareem may want to comment on this from the perspective of both Bangladesh and New Delhi. That is, uh, the people who make these decisions of, of what of policy decisions have different understandings of what the problem is, and therefore different understandings of what the instrument is. In the case of Pakistan, <coughs> it's really they have good understanding of the instrument, instrument, but not a good understanding of the problem. So I think that none of the papers really talked about this at length, although uh, Professor Paraj touched on this, and so did some of Malika's comments. Is there one more? Hi there, I'm uh, Carrie Byron, I'm with IPS, and I used to be, uh, for the last decade, I was with uh, Himal South Asian Magazine in Kathmandu. Uh, I'd like to direct uh, just a brief question to Professor Matthew. I don't know whether Ambassador Kareem wants to uh, comment as well, but I'm just wondering whether, uh, whether this idea of the U.S. Uh, engaging in increasingly pragmatic re relations with so-called middle powers, whether that is in conflict with what uh, Miss Joseph uh, was talking about with regards to uh, India's centrality uh, in, in any broad overarching uh, framework within the region. Um, I, f I find uh, both of them to be like uh, very important in terms of going forward, but I can't figure out whether they're significantly in conflict with one another. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Richard, why don't we start with you and then work this way, okay? Start with me, Will. Um, in, in terms of, of, of the sort of al alternative things that came up in the project, one, one discussion focused on, on the prospects for Indian hegemony in the region. 
and whether whether in India could play the role of you know and what that would require of India if it was going to have to sort of you know try and stabilize the region itself and become and become that that big presence there and what would it have to give and how would it how would it upscale this into larger global global you know foreign institutions and and um, uh, one of the things that came out of the discussions was was that you know there were there's a lot of concerns among the smaller powers about uh, about about you know that type of that type of 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 role for india india becoming sort of the a regional head, hegemon um and and how what that would mean to the deals that they'd be able to to strike um, they're in an awkward position because countries like, you know, Nepal and, and, and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, they interface directly with India but not with each other. So they're, they're, sort, of, they're sort of weak as a bargaining force. It isn't like Bangladesh and Pakistan and Nepal can all get together and, and come up with a, a position. It's sort of like, like the, the North American. It's not like Europe. It's like North America. where you have got Canada up there and Mexico down there. And they, they, don't, they don't ever combine much to, to, to sort of work the U.S., um, but they sort of get what the, what, what, what the best deal they can strike on their own. Um, we also talked a lot, and I think it's been integrated into this discussions about the need to, to, to focus on, on the implications of, of the development of, of the Internet and, and, and I, you know, information technology in managing these types of, of threats. And so you know, that was one of the things I said. What if, what if much of the discussion, much of the, of the problem solving starts to take space Place in that space with lots of you know where, where where the boundaries are very different and 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 the rules of engagement are very very different and they're not defined by you know diplomatic protocols and they're not defined by national interests but they're sort of it's sort of this messy awkward space where people might come together to say we've got to develop a better understanding what what happens in that case if if that becomes the vibrant problem solving political political space. Um, I think that in terms of what we're discovering, your other question, you know, right now it's hard to stop people from getting access to data. Any, you know, I, I think that that anybody can 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 figure out uh, the possible the, 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 a flu a flu epidemic in a city before the CDC by looking up searches for you know runny nose and cold. Uh, and, and following that, the trouble is there's so much data on there. It's pretty difficult for most people to be able to 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 use it efficiently. So so one of the big issues is is not is not sort of sort of you know how do you keep people from sharing it, but how do you make sense out of the massive amounts of data that are there? Yeah, that's a good example. Can we find a thousand other public health related examples of that that are similar to that? So how do we use this massive amount of data to 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 do things? And we got a huge investment in how to use this data to get people to buy stuff. And so there's there that that that's become very sophisticated. It's not very sophisticated in the areas of public health. And we saw with SARS that, you know, little bits and pieces of information caused huge reactions which were really uninformed and inappropriate as people stopped going to Asian restaurants or stopped traveling or decided they wouldn't go to Canada. You know, big costly things which I think the the, the bill was Fifty or sixty billion dollars for things that probably didn't make much sense. So we so we do need more work in understanding <coughs> how you harness big data to to uh, social social ends that are valuable, and that is 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 up in the air air right now. Um, I think that that uh, um, probably it sounds it sounds like like you ought to be talking about about whether whether the idea of of, in, of Recognizing that countries like Canada, and Japan, Australia probably have an important role to play there, um, in, in some ways at odds with also recognizing that India has a has an important role to play there. If that's the question, um, and so on. From from my perspective, I don't see a huge tension in that. I think I think that that, that, that those two things can be reconciled. But but I'll let you. So I don't want to dominate this. So I'll just move on. Harry. Yes. Uh, <coughs> um. Trying to address uh, Steve's question, you mentioned about the child with the hammer lo looking at everything like a nail. Now, are you referring to a child within a domestic context, or are you looking at it uh, uh, outside the domestic context? Uh, the centrality of India certainly weighs heavily on the psyche of Bangladesh, if it is India-Bangladesh relations and the relations around. Uh, but having said that, while the psyche is continues to be 
uh, apprehensive about what India uh, ultimately wants to do. I think a number of concrete measures that have uh, agreements that have been arrived at are an indicator of where uh, India, Bangladesh, and India, other countries' relations might be going. We, we might be in the process of developing a new model of, of, of interaction or interlocution. For example, one of the recent uh, uh, measures that India has taken was a unilateral announcement by them of having removed from 480 items in the negative list all but 25. And those 25 pertain to manufacture of alcohol and refining of petroleum and, and, and stuff like that, which we uh, are not interested in, neither do. But they actually made concessions across the board on all garments and every other product that we are making or we could be making. Uh, Duty-free, quota-free. In a sense, it is a one-way free trade agreement given to us without reciprocity. Now, that is a huge concession. And that had a tremendous impact on the business community. What it has done is it has stirred up the business community into now looking next door, east of Bangladesh, and saying, okay, there's a market of at least 400 million people in upward mobility. Why do I have to go halfway across the world to sell my goods? So that's, that's, uh, that's a change in the drivers and also in the dynamics. All right. Uh, India's agreement after 47 for the first time, stepping out of the box of bilateralism into tentatively, but definitely, in, in, in a sense, into trilateralism or quadrilateralism in terms of addressing problems related to the commons, the, the water problems, the generation of electricity, uh, uh, setting up uh, uh, interconnection of grids. This is a major shift, I think, in India's uh, attitude. Um, thirdly, India allowing, actually saying that Bangladesh can invest 100% FDI in Indian generation schemes and be the owners of powers. So if we can find the money, we can actually go in there and build a power plant and then say, okay, we are putting it in your grid line and I want X quantity here. So this is, you know, a, a major shift. Um, within Bangladesh, I think there is a deep recognition that unless the government starts seriously addressing problems relating to global warming, sea level rise, and, and, and uh, related problems, we are going to have problems 10 years or 15 years down the line. So for once, or for the first time that I see a government actually thinking beyond its elected term, that's a, that's a, a hopeful sign that things are changing. Recently, we've just announced, I think two weeks ago, uh, we are setting up a series, I think three or four uh, monitoring stations along the Bay of Bengal where they will continuously be measuring uh, the the uh, changes in atmospheric uh, temperature, as well as the changes in seawater temperature and the level of seawater rise or decline. Now that, over a period of five to ten years, is going to give you very solid data as to whether global warming is taking place where we are connected or uh, are living and whether that is translating to the seawater and how it is affecting the seawater. Uh, so I hope that answers <coughs> addresses part of the question. If I've missed something, please uh, ask me. Uh, centrality of India and what I think India is looking at itself. It's, it's, uh, it's not a child. It's not an adolescent. It's coming into manhood in, in a, a, as, as a global player. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, has, it understands clearly that if it wants to get into the same league with China, then it has to ensure peace with all its neighbors. Uh, so in a sense... Prime Minister Manmohan Singh is where uh, Deng Xiaoping was in 1979. Stability at home and peace with neighbors. Without this, China cannot be a, a, a great power in the 21st century. Stability, stability at home is a different creature uh, uh, from, from, from the Chinese animal because India is a huge democracy. It's a functional democracy, a robust democracy at a 
times also a dysfunctional democracy. But it is a democracy. Uh, what you are seeing now in India is a sort of transition from the phase of a very strong central government to a phase of uh, uh, reasonably stable coalition governments to a phase where regional powers are becoming more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, active in determining what is their power or role in, 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 in the share in the Constitution and what should be. So the Constitution is being tested and revisited, which creates some problems for the smaller countries or the countries around India, having borders with some of the states. Uh, you know, if, if I'm asked, for example, you have to go and also negotiate with such and such chief minister, my immediate problem and confusion is, do I negotiate with two sovereign authorities? I cannot negotiate with a sub-sovereign authority because I'm a sovereign authority. That creates problems back home within the domestic context. So these are problems that both in transition have to cope with which will require some, some, some patience on our part. Thank you. Mal, do you have um, I think I should thank um, <laughs> Ambassador Karim because I think he's addressed most of the issues which I wanted to bring out as well. But uh, just wanted to put this on the table. Um, what we see now is like after India has toyed um, with the idea of sub-regionalism it's, it's, and it's uh, consolidated itself in um, uh, other regions with the ASEAN, the ARF, and it's got its good relationships with the US or China. It's got a working relationship with most of the powers that are uh, out there. It is time that India now got back to the region and sorted its relationship out. And I think it's, it's come about at a time that when India has come back to the region and is starting to invest in the region uh, and talk about re uh, regionalize, uh, re regionalism, uh, we also find a positive uh, feedback from the regional countries uh, to enter into a dialogue with India, which I think didn't exist uh, a few years ago. So I think there is an opportunity here for regionalism or, um, um, of, or a redu reduction of uh, conflict within the region to happen. And I think that is a very, very positive uh, sign that's emerging. So um, I think I will leave at that. Uh, and I don't see uh, it basically conflicting with other extra-regional powers who are coming, uh, basically, as uh, you mentioned, about uh, US or China or Japan. And I think that also could be a motivating factor, because you're going to have other actors coming into the region. Unless you could uh, be the primary person within the region, you will not be able to um, uh, control or monitor what is happening within the region. So that also could be a motivating factor why India wants to be firmly uh, enmeshed within the region is itself. Thank you. Chair, could I add something to, to uh, uh, the, the, the fact that both India and U.S., which had for long adversarial uh, uh, sort of views on, on regional issues or global issues, are today actually looking on each other as strategic partners makes a huge difference. From having been on opposite sides of the Cold War, which actually spawned many of the problems that we are, uh, find ourselves uh, immersed in, to now being partners uh, uh, could be a big help. And I think, in a sense, quietly, they are doing that. Thanks. Dennis. I just have a, a couple of short remarks. Uh, following up on, on what's been said, um, from my point of view, uh, I learned a lot uh, about uh, South Asia in the process. And one of them is I became very concerned, as I mentioned in my presentation, I became very concerned simply about a 10-year time frame uh, in terms of the impact of, of uh, uh, global warming on South Asia. And I started to read a lot of reports and so forth. And as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, one of the things was, was an expert who mentioned that Bangladesh was the best la uh, laboratory for disaster that could be found uh, in the world. And that caught my attention also. Uh, so my perspective is uh, that uh, because of the nature of security as I, def as I define it, uh, that is ecological security, uh, we have this problem of four dimensions, uh, most of which in one way or another deal with nature, and most of which are going to be impacted 
uh, by global warming or also increased globalization. By increased globalization, I mean more people are traveling both directions, uh, goods and services are traveling and so forth. The rapidity with which disease will be traveling uh, in the future uh, will be very, very rapid. And uh, these are the aspects of that dimension uh, that I worry about the most. Now the good news that, that I picked up from this experience uh, is I used, usually read the Wall Street Journal, uh, which tells me a lot about the troubles that India is having uh, manufacturing anything uh, in India. Uh, but in reality, you start reading other things in the project indicated to me that these countries really are doing something significant here uh, that hasn't been done before that hopefully will offset uh, these factors sometime in the next decade. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, Jeff, and then back here? Thank you all for your presentations. And I, I um, found the focus on the kind of institutional architecture um, uh, with a frame of non-traditional security, very helpful um, in, in part, it, like Richard, focusing on the, some of the water and the climate issues and how those play. Um, the, the institutions being key to whether those shared challenges um, pull the countries closer with the imper imperative cooperation because of the shared interdependencies around these issues or whether the, the stresses in those areas pull them apart or, or, or make it harder for the ambassador to do his job in bringing them together. Uh, and so I guess I would uh, ask a question, and maybe a specific one, and I don't know if there are other analogies in the other um, non-traditional security issue topics, but it strikes me that it, uh, some of these very interdependencies in the case of water, for example, and increased uh, stresses, um, have um, have the prospect for connecting the traditional and the non-traditional security uh, agenda. And so when we see, for example, um, those who have broader political interests and desires around Kashmir, using the, the perception of reality, and we can debate which it is, um, but on, on water issues and equity issues between India and Pakistan as a way to mobilize national response for broader agendas, then there are, uh, one can envision all sorts of positive roles for the data sharing and that, that one would um, want to continue to see in terms of the cooperation on the Indus and such. Uh, but nevertheless, that some of those non-traditional security issues are going to make that traditional security um, agenda more difficult and, and, pose some, and, and pose some real challenges there. And so, again, back to the institutions, the way that one deals with that is to have strong mechanisms for, for tampening down the kind of exploitation of, the, of, uh, of that uh, kind of demagoguing, whether it's real or perceived, uh, on what are real, very real issues, but nevertheless ones that can be abused when connecting it to the broader security question. So I'm not sure if there's a question there per se, but it, it strikes me that on, on one hand it's, it's uh, a frame of, of traditional versus non-traditional, and part of what many of you have said is the real challenge can come uh, is in the inter intersection of the two. Where was our second hand? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sher Shah. I'm here from uh, Marine University in Quantico, Virginia. I work there as a subject matter expert on Afghanistan. But uh, uh, security being the key uh, to economic and political development, if we analytically reframe Afghanistan as part of South Asia, Afghanistan or any other South Asian country, as Matthew previously called it, a messy place uh, where borders are really messed up. So, uh, if, uh, uh, so South Asian, uh, all these countries uh, have uh, uh, the ingredients for a potential uh, geopolitical nightmare. Uh, my question is how can we urge uh, U.S. Uh, uh, to stay determined to a long-term uh, regional uh, strategic partnership uh, dis uh, despite uh, recurring tensions and huge problems in Afghanistan and in the region. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there a third question? Well, why don't we have our panelists address the two questions that we have, if you have some reactions uh, to, to Jeff's question about whether non-traditional security issues Rather, it, it, the, the flip side of what we were trying to do, which is to demonstrate patterns of cooperation that can help. In fact, they could be used as a proxy or as a, as a means for exacerbating existing security tensions, if I heard your question correctly. And then the, the question of Afghanistan and, and U.S. Uh, enduring commitment there and what that might mean for the broader region. Any of our pan Amal? Okay. Um, actually, these uh, non-traditional security issues, a lot of those things come under functional areas. When uh, states start cooperating on functional issues, then sometimes it helps uh, the resolution of those, uh, non, you know, traditional security issues, and that that that's the whole rationale behind SARC. I mean, even, I mean, SARC may not be a 100% success. However, it has generated uh, some, um, you know, functional cooperation. Uh, so in that sense, uh, non-traditional security issues can be made a forum for cooperation. And secondly, on, on Afghanistan, uh, actually, um, security issues have dominated the discourse on Afghanistan. Uh, however, now Afghanistan is a SARC member. And uh, Afghanistan, biggest problem, one of the problems uh, Afghanistan is having is its isolation. And in fact, uh, President Karzai, when he joined SARC, uh, he enthusiastically mentioned about the ending of isolation. And the other thing is, uh, the, now Afghanistan is a SARC member. That means... Now, when you talk of regional solutions to Afghanistan, people only talk of uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, uh, the Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, Afghanistan, China. Nobody talks about um, Afghanistan's extended neighborhood. That means uh, um, Bangladesh and uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and countries like that. And now, actually now, if there is going to be a peacekeeping force uh, for Afghanistan in the, in the future, after the U.S. withdrawal, then India and Pakistan cannot provide uh, troops because of the close engagement with, with, with Afghanistan. But Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, these are the countries which can contribute to uh, that kind of a scenario. Not only that, if you are talking of civil society, you know, formation of civil societies in Afghanistan. You don't find the vibrant kind of civil societies uh, other South Asian countries are having, not in Iran, not in, uh, you know, other, other neighborhood, uh, and, and, and gender issues. And, and you know, Pak uh, Afghanistan becoming a member of SAG, um, even though people don't appreciate that very much, I think uh, that has a lot of meaning. Thank you. Um. I, I try and address uh, what what uh, the, the point that Jeffrey <laughs> raised. Uh, yes, there can be an inter intersection between the non-traditional tradition, certainly in respect to Pakistan, and that's why it was. I think all of us this project uh, suffered because uh, or, or had a shortcoming in the fact that there was no participation from Pakistan, which was I think sad. It was also tragic, but I think also symptomatic of the problem that whether SARC is actually functioning and how much it is functioning effectively. Uh, whether it was a visa problem or an inability to get a clearance to actually come and attend a conference like this, or a combination of both, or just a, not interested. All right, so that, that's a sad commentary, I think. Uh, and, and that is precisely the point from where I come. Uh, when, I, when I thought about 15, 20 years ago that SARC is a track which retards the rest of SARC. I mean, problems in one SARC subregion detracts the rest of the SARC subregion from moving forward. We are at a point where subregions, the eastern subregion and southern subregion, that's Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, India, and then India, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, 
they are in a position to move very fast forward because they don't have major political issues with, with, between each other. The problem is on the western sub-region where you have, you had Pakistan first, and now you also have Afghanistan. So a, a complicated situation has become more complex. Uh, water problems, yes, serious water problems to be addressed. Uh, I think there will be problems in their addressing it in the same manner as we are trying to address it, simply because on this side, it's, it's, it's the, the politics has become more congenial. People are willing to talk to each other, and people have decided this is the way to go forward. Uh, as long as that transformation does not take place on the Western side, you're not going to be able to see much forward movement. It's a pessimistic view, but maybe I have turned cynic uh, over, over the last 50 years of having watched this process. Um, <coughs> will somebody else step in to fill the vacuum? Difficult to say, I think, because there, are, there will be political problems within the countries that you suggested, whether they should actually go and be peace speakers there or, or peacekeepers there. There has to be a political consensus on that. And I don't think they have got around yet to that. They're, they're sort of touching the issue on the fringes, but they're scared of getting the fingers burnt. And, and that's a problem. And whether the U.S. will say or not, that's a question with U.S. panel members will have to, will be better positioned to address. Um, so I, I think that in terms of, of, of the linkage you're talking about, the region has the, the sort of gener general conditions that people like Collier have identified. Um, what, wh whether whether you, you end up getting wars depends on things like, like the type of leadership, what sort of military plans are in place? What, what sort of what sort of perceptions people have of, of what the intentions of, of other countries are? Those sort of things figure into into that decision. I think in, in an area like water, there is there is lots of, of reasons for concern. You know, the 210 million people live in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, and that's that's the source of most of the surface water for three billion people. Um, so you've got so th so so there's this little concentration where most of the surface water comes from. Um, and and so so at the same time you've got massive groundwater depletion in the area. When you look at it objectively, you know, take a country like Pakistan, their problems are are unsustainable groundwater use and and tremendously inefficient infrastructure. The problems that can be solved, um, but they also have reason to be. Con they have no storage capability, and so when they see dams being built, which might be a, a logical thing to do given unknowns about water they can look very threatening so so and 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 how do you how do you what, what sort of institution can can allow for some general principles while still recognizing that the different countries are going to have to customize their response to water stress in in you know in terms of of their needs their capabilities uh, and 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 their position in the system so it isn't like there's a uniform response that would work for China and India and Pakistan on water security even though they have a sort of common a common problem so you need institutions that can be that allow for some customization of the actual of the actual solution that can be repurposed and that can adapt to what is a very rapidly changing situation. You, so, so we've got you know water today may the dy water dynamics today may be very different in five years. So you need institutions that can adapt. These are some things that we don't have have good models for. So, so, so we don't know how to create those institutions that can allow for lots of customization but can adapt quickly and 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 so on and so forth. I do think that that we could and we ought to start experimenting with, with systems that we have reason to believe might be useful, um, moving them out of their national containers and into regional settings, like RED and RED Plus and payment for ecosystem services, and say, what happens if we get those systems working at a regional basis? Can we create incentives which sort of marshal people to say, well, we've all got an incentive to cooperate around this because we're going to get paid for it. Um, and I think that we should be creative and not just saying we're going to have red Pakistan and red Bangladesh and red Nepal and red, but start to say, you know, we're going to have red Hindu Kush Himalaya and, and what will that look like and how can that bring people together while at the same time allowing for customization and, and adaptation to very different positions in, in the hydrological system. Thank you. I think we've come to the end of our time. 
And so uh, thank you for joining us today, and thanks again to our presenters. Um, Jeff, Mahin, do you have any final words? Uh, then we will be concluded. Thank you.